We're carrying on in our study of this fourth gospel, Gospel of John, and we're in chapter 6, John chapter 6, and Lord willing, Lord enabling, we will get through to the end of the chapter this morning. As you're turning there, I just want to do a little test of your Canadian geography, um, just wondering, wondering if anyone remembers, I don't think you will, but how many major watersheds Canada has? <laughs> how many major watersheds Canada has? I'll define or explain what a watershed is, but maybe there are some geography nerds here. I see Paul counting on his fingers. Um, I'm not sure if he fits into that category or, or not, but any, uh, any takers for uh, uh, watersheds in Canada? Paul says he's holding his hand up three. Well, you would have been better. Ray says five. Five watersheds. Did you Google it? Okay. All right. So five major watersheds. So if we got a map here, just go with me. Uh, on the west coast, all the water flows on the other side of the mountain flows where? To the Pacific. If we go up into the northern prairies and the territories, the water flows where? To the, Atlant uh, to the Arctic. Uh, if we drop down into the, the Midwest section of the country, the, the middle provinces, the water flows, believe it or not, all the way down to the Gulf of Mexico, some of the major rivers that flow down through the U.S. In uh, eastern Manitoba and northern Ontario, the water flows into the Hudson Bay. And then the rest of Ontario and east of Canada all flows into the Atlantic. Those are all watersheds where the water gathers. And so any of our, of our local resident truckers uh, as you, you'll, you'll remember or you'll have seen many of these signs as you're driving through northern Ontario where it says you are now entering into the Arctic watershed, for example, or the Hudson Bay. All the water from here flows north to this direction. If you're coming the other way on the highway, it'll say you're heading into the, I'm not sure which one, but all the water flows south. And, uh, and so these watersheds, um, it's, it's basically what we're saying is it's a, it's a high point and from that point all the water flows in one direction or the other. And, uh, and so it's kind of interesting, you can step from one side of the line to the other and, and conceivably, you know, if it didn't soak in, you'd pour the water in one spot and it would all flow in the one direction uh, if you, perhaps if you're out in the west, it, it would be flowing in the direction of uh, the Gulf of Mexico. Or if you cross that line, step over it, um, it would be flowing north um, to the Arctic Ocean. And so that's the idea of a, of a watershed. And so sometimes that idea is used as a, as a metaphor, the, the idea of a watershed decision or a watershed moment where where something happens, where a decision is made, will, will affect the trajectory of your life. Um, where you make a major decision, and whether it's to pursue further education maybe, instead of going into the workforce right away. Or, or maybe for, for many of us it's been that watershed decision, that big decision to get married. Um, that, that affects things in a significant way. Maybe it's a, a switch in careers, whatever it may be. Those are, those are major watershed moments. I'd like us to, as we read our passage this morning, see if we can observe a, a watershed moment here in, in our portion. This is John chapter 6, and we're going to begin at verse 60 and read down to the end of the chapter. This is following the, the bread of life teaching that the Lord Jesus gave in the synagogue in Capernaum. Verse 60, Therefore many of his disciples, when they heard this, said, 
This is a hard saying. Who can understand it? When Jesus knew in himself that his disciples complained about this, he said to them, Does this offend you? What then if you should see the Son of Man ascend where he was before? It is the Spirit who gives life. The flesh profits nothing. The words that I speak to you are spirit, and they are life. But there are some of you who do not believe. For Jesus knew from the beginning who they were who did not believe and who would betray him. And he said, therefore, I have said to you that no one can come to me unless it has been granted to him by my Father. Verse 66, from that time, many of his disciples went back and walked with him no more. Then Jesus said to the twelve, do you also want to go away? But Simon Peter answered him, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. Also, we have come to believe and know that you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. Jesus answered them, Did I not choose you, the twelve, and one of you is a devil or an adversary? He spoke of Judas Iscariot, the son of Simon, for it was he who would betray him, being one of the twelve. And we'll end our reading there at the end of the, the chapter. So a lot has been happening up to this moment. If we go back all the way back in the beginning of chapter 6, we see the Lord Jesus feeding the crowd of 5,000 along with the women and children, possibly upwards of, of 20,000 people with five loaves and two fish. As much as they wanted, you remember that, as much as they wanted, they were filled. But then as we follow the, the storyline, we see that Jesus pulls away from this crowd because he perceived, he recognized that here was a crowd who wanted to take him by force and make them their, his king, or their king rather. And so we were asking ourselves the question, is, is Jesus just uh, someone we view as an accessory to our lives? Uh, or do we see him as a daily necessity? Is he one that is just the, the means to an end, that we can get what we want? Or do we really want him and, and to be in a relationship with him? We heard the Lord Jesus then challenge this crowd in the bread of life teaching when he says, you know, it's not just that God has provided for your physical needs, he's provided for your spiritual needs. And he uses bread as a, a metaphor for himself. And just as we need to take something in physically to sustain us and to, uh, to sustain our lives, in the same way the Lord Jesus is saying you need to take something in spiritually as well to sustain you. You're, you're not independent. You're not self-existent. You, you, need, you need me. And, and he presents himself as the bread of life. They were proud about their association with Moses. Moses, he, he gave us bread from heaven in the, in the wilderness. And the Lord Jesus, in his gracious way, says, you know, I'm actually the bread. I, I, and he's making a claim. I'm better than Moses. Uh, I am the bread of life. Uh, your fathers, your, your ancestors, they're, they're all dead in the wilderness. They ate the manna but they died. I'm offering myself the bread of life. If you believe my message, if you take me into your life, you will experience not just a temporary uh, experience of life, but eternal life. And he goes on and he, and he challenges them with this, uh, this fact that they need to, using metaphoric language again, he, he, you've got to eat this bread and you, you've got to drink, or eat my flesh rather, and, and drink my blood. And he's, he's talking here about the cross and the work of the cross and making it personal. But the problem was, he points out at different times, um, You've seen me, but you're not believing. And he recognized that, that he was talking to a crowd that did not believe. 
And so the more the Lord Jesus spoke through this discourse on the bread of life, the more outrageous and, and, and offensive it was to the crowd that was listening, saying that he's better than Moses and that he's the bread from heaven and talking about eating my flesh and drinking my blood. To, the, to them, they were hearing this idea of cannibalism, really? And, and they were just, they were, they were beside themselves. It says, it says that they murmured, they were, they were quarreling among themselves, they were complaining. And, and you can just imagine the scene, and, or if you, if you haven't tried, I encourage you to. Here, here's this crowd in this synagogue in Capernaum. Capernaum, again, is that little village on the north shore of the Sea of Galilee. And, and on this day, uh, the, it would have been overflowing. There would have been the locals that would have come to the synagogue. But then there were all the people that had come across the Sea of Galilee that had experienced being fed the miracle lunch. And so there was this crowd of people there. And, and after listening to Jesus speak and the things that had been said, you can, you can just imagine some of them would have been mumbling to each other and saying, this, this is crazy. Uh, we're out of here. We have listened long enough. This is, this is too much. And, and one by one, if, if there had been a back door like this off to the side, they would have been sneaking out the back door. One, one by one, as, as the time went on, they didn't want anything more to do with him and, and now this is where my imagination is, is, is going. I, I can just see by the end of the day as maybe even the sun is setting. And, and by this point, the, the room, the synagogue that has been just overflowing with people is, is now emptied out. And it's basically what you have left is Jesus and his 12, his, his disciples, his, his intimates. And, and he says to them, in, as we have it recorded here in verse 67, as he, as he looks around at them, he, he says to them, uh, and I think this is the, the way that it, it's best translated, surely you don't want to go away as well, do you? And, and what strikes me about this scene and, and about this question that Jesus asks is, is how personal this has become. This, this is not a matter of some kind of theological debate and taking sides in a theological debate or you know what, what church or what synagogue do I associate with. What it comes down to is, is a decision that each one was making and, and the Lord Jesus would feel this personally this, this question or this decision that they were making was this. Uh, are we going to walk with Jesus or are we going to walk away from Jesus? And that's, that's really what it came down to. We can talk about faith. We can talk about unbelief. But, but how did it manifest itself in the moment? This was the moment. This was the watershed moment, the decision that was going to be made that each of them was going to make that was going to affect the trajectory of their lives. Are, are we going to walk with him or are we going to walk away from him? John here is, is recording, I think, a, a powerful contrast between two groups of people and, and how they respond differently to the Lord Jesus and to his message. And, and I believe that, that John is recording this because, because he wants us to respond the way Peter responded. And, and how do we know that? Because John said, remember, at the end of the gospel, I'm writing these things. And notice what Peter said here in verse 68 and 69. But, but this is what John said, I'm writing to us. I'm writing these things so that you may know that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you might have life in his name. That's, that's essentially the confession of Peter here. And, and John is saying, I want, you, I want you to take that stand. I want you to, here's, here's, the, here's the contrast between those who are walking away and, and those who, who are, are taking a stand for, for Christ. 
In if ever there was a watershed moment, this is it. Now back to the topic of watersheds. In the last 10 years or so, it's, it's become quite common and there's been major efforts by local governments and, and national governments to identify the different watersheds. Uh, it's part of their strategy for clean water and these kinds of things to identify the watershed. So there's signs so that when you drive somewhere, you're seeing what watershed you're, you're entering into. And the reason being is because they hope it will affect your behavior. That rather than uh, me pouring out not that I've ever done this, but rather than me pouring out old motor oil on the ground on the driveway, um, I'm going to find a safe place to put it. Why? Because I know that, that or I'm supposed to understand that my motor oil um, is going to, to run eventually down the creek across our farm into the Conestoga River and eventually to the uh, Grand River and then eventually to the uh, Lake Erie and, uh, and then it's going to flow over the falls and it's going to go into Lake Ontario and down the St. Lawrence River and, and eventually into the Atlantic Ocean. And imagine if all of us were pouring our oil out and letting it run when we change our oil. Um, imagine the cumulative effort and, or the cumulative effect that that would have. And so, so the message with these signs is um, think about what you're doing because it, it, it's going to affect ultimately the Atlantic Ocean. And I think what John is doing here is, is he's highlighting this watershed moment and he's saying, I want, you to, I want you to recognize that the choice that you have every day of your life, and it's this, am I going to, am I going to believe the message that God gives me? Am I going to believe what God says is true? Or am I going to base my life on what I see and feel around me? In the one, one course, the one decision, uh, we, we walk with Christ. With the other, we walk away from him. And so we have these, these two groups, these two classes, you might say. Uh, exhibit A is this first group. And notice they're both called disciples. They're both uh, pupils. They're both learners. Um, not necessarily true believers, because we, we see that here. There were some who didn't believe, but they were, they were attracted to the Lord Jesus, at least for a while. And they were, they were following along, and, and uh, they, they were at least sympathetic to the things that he was saying and the claims that he was making for at least for a certain length of time. But eventually here in verse 60, uh, as they've listened to everything that Jesus has said, they've said, this is, this is a hard saying. Who can understand it? The thought here is not that it's hard to understand. The, the thought here is it's hard to accept. The Lord Jesus was make, making these, these hard statements, these difficult claims, and, and they were finding it hard to accept. Now, it's important to recognize that this isn't the first hard saying that Jesus makes and it's certainly not going to be the last hard saying that he made. In fact, there were many things Jesus said that, that cut across the grain of, of our sinful human nature and across the, the cultural norms and we we've even face that today. There's much in the word of God that is hard uh, many things that that could be described as going against the the and directly opposed to what our culture is saying around us. They're hard sayings, and and they're difficult to to understand and accept. And and we think later of what the Lord Jesus said in the upper room in John 14, uh, "I'm the way, the truth, and the life, and no one comes to the Father." except through me. The exclusivity of the gospel and the claims of Christ is hard for many to accept. Uh, we live in a world that is, is okay with some level of Jesus and some amount of Jesus, but if you make the claim that he is the only way, um, that becomes a great offense. It's a hard saying. 
There were all kinds of things um, in the Word of God or, or that are in the Word of God. We think of what Paul says in 1 Corinthians. He says the message of the cross is, is foolishness to those who are perishing or headed for destruction. But to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. And then he goes on and he says, the Jews are offended by this message. The, the Greeks say it's nonsense. Think of the Lord's words to Nicodemus. The epitome of, of a good man. At least that's what religion would have thought and the religious people would have thought he was a ruler of the Jews. He was, he was, he was an important man and, and is highly esteemed. And, and Jesus said, none of that's of any value. You, you must be born again. These are hard sayings. Well, verse 61 is when Jesus knew in himself that his disciples complained and again, we, we just see a, a window into the, what we might call the omniscience of the Lord Jesus, the fact that he knows all things. Um, he knew what, what they were thinking. He knew what was going on in private conversations. And he says, are, are you offended by this? And then he says, you know, if... If you're offended by the thought that I've said I've come down from heaven, what are you going to do with, with the message of the resurrection? If, if you're finding it hard to believe that I've come from heaven, what, what are you going to do? If, what, what if I start talking about the resurrection, about the bodily resurrection, a man going up into heaven? If you were offended before, this is going to be a tough one for you to swallow. And then in verse 63, he gives it to them straight. There's no, there's no metaphors being used here. And these are, he says to him, these are spiritual truths. It is the, the spirit of God that gives life. It's not, it's not physically eating something. And, and so he's stripping away all of the metaphoric language. And, and he's saying, the words that I speak to you, the, the message that I bring to you is a message that contains life. The words that I speak to you are spirit and they are life. These are spiritual truths. It's not, it's not the physical eating of food. It's, the, it's believing the message, the words that I have to say to you. And we, we might say, well... I feel sorry for the Jews, these Jews. They, how were they supposed to know? Well, this goes all the way back. This is a truth that goes all the way back to the beginning of the Old Testament. Even back in the book of Moses in, in Deuteronomy, it says there, related to the manna, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. That was a truth that had come from from way back at the beginning, from their heritage. And, and yet they were, they were missing this truth that every word proceeds, that every man should not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. And so Jesus is saying to them, I, I know that there are some of you who don't believe. He's made this offer, as I mentioned last time, almost 10 times in these previous verses, listen, if you believe, you'll have life. If you, if you eat the bread of life, if you eat, if you take in this message that I've brought from my Father, you, you will have life, you will have eternal life. But, but they wouldn't believe, um, as it says here, there are some of you who do not believe. And again, we see what Jesus understood and what he knew he he foreknew we could say he knew from the beginning in this crowd that that had gathered around him he knew who were the believers and who weren't it wasn't a surprise to him even to the point of the one who would betray him he knew in in advance who it would who it was that was going to receive the message and who it was that wouldn't in verse 65, as, as we come to, the, to kind of the, the end of this section on this first group of, of disciples, 
he makes a statement that, that seems to be the final straw um, for, for these people. And he, and he says to them, or what he's doing, he's reminding them of something he said earlier. And it, and it goes back to verse 44. And we looked at this the other time where Jesus said, no one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him. And talked about how, how the Spirit of God is at work and, and he's, he's calling, he's wooing, he's convicting men and women. In fact, in Romans 1, I was just reading it again the other day, um, it says there that men are without excuse because they can look to the heavens and they can, can see the reality of, of, of God and, and, his, and his character. They're not his character, his qualities. The, the, let me read it. It says it, it, says it so clearly in, in Romans chapter 1. The wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth, that is, they hold down the truth, because what may be known of God is manifest in them, for God has shown it to them. How has he shown it? For since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. So the Lord Jesus here in verse 65, as he's talking to this group, and, uh, and it's this last straw, what is he, what is he saying to them? He's, he's reminding them, listen, it's the Father who is doing this deep internal work in our hearts, and, and he's convicting us of our sin and our guilt, and he's calling us, he's drawing us. For what purpose, the Lord Jesus said? It's so that you would come to me, and this was, the, this was the great offense. Here's Jesus, you can imagine, in the synagogue, and he's saying, listen, God the Father, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, your God is, is working in your heart so that you would come to me, to the Lord Jesus. And, and the Lord Jesus is making this connection between the God of heaven and, and himself, and it was, it was just an absolute offense to them that that the Lord Jesus here is implying listen if you're rejecting me and not coming to me you're rejecting what God is doing and God is if you reject me you're rejecting God's active work in your life and they were simply unwilling to accept this connection they right from the beginning they they did not want to hear of of Jesus' connection with heaven and, and his heavenly father. And it seems that that was the straw that broke the camel's back. And, uh, and they turned and they, they walked away, verse 66 says. They walked with him no more. They turned back to their old way of life. They turned away from the very one who had come to give them eternal life, to save them. And they said, it's too much. Um, we're, we're turning our back, we're leaving. And, and so that's the first exhibit, those, exhibit A, those who heard the message of the Lord Jesus straight from his lips, but they did not respond with, with faith by believing, and, and they turned their back and rejected him. But then we have exhibit B, this group of uh, the 12 that remained with him. And, and Jesus says to them, do you also want to go away? And what happens next, as Jesus asks that question, I feel, I was thinking of this um, this week, it almost is like Peter here is having um, a Ruth moment. Do you have any idea what I mean by that? Peter is having a Ruth moment. Well, do you remember the story of Ruth? How, how she went with her, or with her, her mother-in-law, Naomi, went down into Moab and uh, got two wives for her sons. Long story short, the sons die, and Ruth is returning back to her homeland 
and she's bringing her two daughters along from Moab where they worshiped other, other gods. They were idol worshipers. And they're coming along, they're on their way home and, and Naomi stops and she says, you know what? I have, I have nothing to offer you in this life here. Why don't you just go back to where you came from? And, and to summarize the story, Ruth's sister, she, she listened to her mother-in-law's advice and she turned back and she went home to Moab to the idol worshipers and where she'd come from. But Ruth, you might say she, she had a watershed moment. She responded to her mother-in-law and this is, this is what she said. She said, don't ask me to leave you and turn back. Wherever you go, I will go. Wherever you live, I will live. Your people will be my people. Your God will be my God. Wherever you die, I will die, and there I will be buried. May the Lord punish me severely if I allow anything but death to separate us. Ruth recognized in that moment, where else would I go? And, and she aligned herself. She made a decision. You could say that was a watershed moment. It affected the, the trajectory of her life. And, and what happened? Well, we get to the end of the book of Ruth and we find out that she's in the lineage of the Messiah. She's the actual great-grandmother of King David and, and ultimately uh, the ultimate greater than David that would come. And so talk about a historic watershed moment, meeting, uh, making that decision and then going and, and uh, meeting Boaz and so on and so on. Peter says, Lord, to whom shall we go? The words that you have are words of life. Words that carry life, you might say. There's no one else to, there's no other place to go. It's not as if there were no other options. They could have done what the others had done and just, just turned their back on the Lord Jesus and gone away from him. They, they had that option. They had their fishing boats they could have gone to. They had a life before. But, but what Peter was saying here on behalf of the others, he was saying, there's no one else who can offer life. There's, there's no one else who has words of life. And, and then he goes on and says, and furthermore, we have come to believe and know that you are the Christ, the son of the living God. So important to see the order of those words. He said, we have come to believe first. They took him at his word and then they came to know by experience. Just like you would come to know through a relationship and grow in intimacy. They heard, they heard the testimony of John. They had seen the, the Lord's signs and the miracles along the way that pointed to him as the Messiah. And, and they, they responded. They believed. And, and, and they went forward. They made that choice. Uh, Peter having his Ruth moment uh, to align himself with the Lord Jesus and to walk with him. They didn't turn back. They didn't turn away. Imagine, imagine if they had. Their life may have been a lot easier. We know it wasn't perfect. We know that even after this watershed moment when they had decided to and chosen to align with the Lord Jesus, we know that uh, there's an account of, of them, him denying, Peter denying the Lord Jesus three times. The other disciples all forsook him and fled. It wasn't a perfect straight line uh, to glory. There were the dips and dives along the way to be sure. But, but they, uh, as, as Peter identified himself and spoke on behalf of these disciples, they were, they were making a decision. This was a, a watershed moment uh, for them as they, as they made a decision not to turn away and walk with him no more, but to walk with him. Lord Jesus, in these last couple of verses, reminds them, gently corrects Peter. Peter has so boldly spoken for the twelve 
And the Lord res reminds Peter, gently corrects him and says, well, there is actually, there is actually one in the group um, that doesn't share the same views with you. The Lord knew that even though that these, the, the, um, that these 12 were, as Jesus said in verse 70, did I not choose you, the 12, and one of you is a devil or one of you is an adversary? The, the word um, is the same for, for devil or Satan, um, but when it's talking about Satan himself, um, there's always a... Um, What's the word in front of it? An article. Um, and, and so this is, here he's, he's referring to a uh, adversary. And so anyways, this was the nature of the one that, that Judas um, would take on as, as, a, 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 as the one who would betray the Lord Jesus. And so this is a, this is a watershed moment. I've used that word a lot, but I think that this, what we have here is the Spirit of God highlighting this, this moment for us. And, and the reality is, here we are 2,000 years later, every day you and I are confronted with these watershed choices, these, these defining moments, these decisions that we make. And, and it's fair to say that the decision that these disciples were making here and the, the, the parallel decision that we make um, will have, have a greater impact on the direction of our life than any other direction or decision we make. And it's a decision that we make in our day probably the first time before we even roll out of bed in the morning. And the decision is this, Am, am I going to allow God to speak into my life through his word? And am I going to respond to it? Or am I going to turn away and do it my own way? Am I going to be like the, the, the first group who, who hears but rejects and turns away? And, and, and we end up living our life more and more independently of him, of God himself. We find it easier and easier to ignore him as we, as we go further and further away. It's a dangerous way to live. John, the same human author in his first epistle, says of, of a group of people, they went out from us, but they were not of us. For if they had been of us, they would have continued with us. But they went out that it might be plain that they are not of us. And so unbelief caused them to turn away from the Lord Jesus, away from the only one who could offer and provide spiritual life as God intended them to experience it. On the other hand, if we take the response of Peter and his disciples, his fellow disciples, and we say, who else would I want to listen to? Where else could I turn? I can't trust any other source. I'm going to take time in my day to hear what God has to say. I, I, I believe what he says to be true. And, and because I believe what he says to tr is true, I'm going to open my ear. I'm going to, I'm going to open my Bible and, and hear what God has to say. And I'm going to align my life with this book and what God has to say. And the result of that is a closer walk with him, a greater intimacy. We, we walk in union with him and we experience more of him in the process. As, the, as we take in the bread of life, we discover that he's the one that satisfies and nourishes our souls. And so as I, as I close this morning, I, I recognize that even, even as we're here this morning, we, we can have a watershed moment. We can, we, can, we can make a choice here, just like the disciples. Either I'm going to hear what God has to say, in this case through this feeble servant. I'm, I'm going to hear what God has to say about his word or I'm going to reject it. I'm going to respond or I'm going to ignore it and dismiss it and, and with, the, with the hard attitude. Let me just get back to what I was doing before and leave me alone. 
The, the choice is, is ours. It is ours every day, either to walk with him or to walk away from him. There's no greater choice in our life to make. We either choose to walk with him, responding to his word and the things that he says, or we choose to walk away from him. We see that choice all the way through scripture. It's not just a New Testament reality, a, a church truth reality. We see it all the way back in, in Elijah's day. We see it back even further in Joshua's day. Remember when he stood before the people and he calls them uh, to, to uh, incline their hearts to the Lord and, and, then he, and to obey his voice. And then he makes this great statement in Joshua 24. He says, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Father, we recognize that every one of us have a choice to make as we hear your word. Uh, we have the choice to either respond to it in faith, believing it to be true and obeying it, or we, we turn away from it, we reject it and go our own way. Lord, it's a sobering thing to think that anyone would want to walk away from the very one who has been sent from heaven to rescue us. Lord, perhaps there's someone here even today that, that has, has ignored you, and perhaps even today this would be, um, Lord, the opportunity for you to speak into their hearts and for them to respond and say, I want to be, I want to be like Peter. I want to respond. I want to be like Ruth. I, I want to be like Joshua. I want to make that choice to align myself with you. Lord, help us to respond to your word in faith and obedience. We know that's what ultimately draws us closer to you. And so we pray for your help to do so even in this week to come. We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen.